Professor Banaszek uh, finished his uh, PhD uh, under the supervision of Professor Wutkiewicz on the measurement of quantum state in uh, phase space. Uh, that we, uh, is very useful for us uh, in, in uh, um, scientists in Poland as well. And he is also uh, the co-founder of uh, uh, the enterprise Quantum Optical Technologies that, is, uh, um, that will uh, implement uh, some uh, quantum uh, um, information uh, concepts in practice. Uh, and uh, he is also the leader of uh, Cluster Q, which is the cluster of quantum technologies. And finally, uh, he is the um, correspondent member of the Polish Academy of Science. So it's a rather lengthy introduction, but there's a lot of things to say. So now, uh, um, please, Professor Banaszek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and, and the introduction. Just one correction. The Pantera program is coordinated by Sylvia Kostka. From the National Science Center, I'm only the scientific coordinator, so I help her in scientific matters. But when it comes to the Quantera program, it's basically Sylvia who has been involved from the beginning, and she she manages to keep everything together. So uh, I would like to tell you today a little bit about a subject that is not very theoretical, and maybe one can also discuss whether it's physics or more optical engineering but i think it's interesting uh, altogether so it's it's i thought that it might be worth presenting uh, because it deals with the problem in optical communication i learned that uh, optical communication is based on lots of acronyms i will try to I use those acronyms screen, sparingly but i i thought that i i couldn't resist the uh, the option to put at least some acronyms in in the title, but I hope those acronyms will become uh, will become clear in, in during the talk. So the basic problem we will be discussing today is uh, optical communication in space, and there are many reasons why you may want to uh, send data or information between spacecraft and spacecraft or spacecraft and earth for the a typical uh, scenario is that our spacecraft collects a lot of data and it's not really difficult i mean if we think how much data can be collected by a regular smartphone i mean this is megabytes of data per second and this can be very interesting data for us on earth for example observational data or on other hands we would like to uh, have a possibility to send a lot of data between different points on Earth, but we do not, we cannot really have a regular optical fiber networks. And I'm, I'm sure that everybody has heard about Starlink these days. So the legacy technology to do that is, is radio frequency communication, but there are two main issues. One issue is that Usually we cannot achieve data rates that are much higher than the carrier frequency of our electromagnetic wave. So if our carrier frequency is of the order of one gigahertz, we should expect data rates much less than that. And typically one can achieve tens of megabits per, uh, per second. And the second thing is that is the fraction. I mean, at radio frequency wavelengths, our beams diverge and we usually we are able to collect only a small fraction of the emitted power in the receiver and both those issues can be addressed by switching from the radio frequency band to the optical band so one thing that is nice is that the uh, carrier frequency is much higher and basically for practical purposes our bandwidth is kind of unlimited in this scenario at least initially unless we we push things very far and secondly those laser beams that would be emitted from a, a satellite or, or a spacecraft are much better collimated of course we have to uh, take into account the fraction but uh, i will get to that point in a moment if we are not interested in very large distances the size of the beam on earth can be order can be order order of hundreds of meters so the uh, space to ground 
optical communication can be considered in many different scenarios. For example, if we want to look closely what is happening on Earth, we would like to use low Earth orbit satellite, which is the, this is the closest range of orbits to Earth. But one of the problems we are facing is that those uh, LEO satellites, they move very fast. So if we would like to establish a communication link, we have uh, single minutes for that, simply because the satellite will fly over and then will hide behind the horizon. We can have uh, uh, medium air quality satellites. What is nice about geostationary satellites is that if we put them somewhere above, they will stay there because they will, the angular velocity will be exactly the same as the Earth. And one regime that is very interesting from the physical point of view, imagine that we send a mission to another planet of the solar system or even beyond, and we would like to collect data from that mission. This is usually called deep space regime or deep space optical communication regime. So optical communication is a relatively new technology that there are several recent demonstrations I will present in a moment with many exciting, many uh, very promising aspects, some of them I mentioned. Another one that is not really, that is actually quite substantial are uh, lower or no regulatory requirements. If we want to use radio frequency communication, we have to apply for a permit, not uh, the, this radio frequency spectrum is very crowded. And with some exceptions, I mean, we can shoot laser beams quite freely so far. Uh, and as I mentioned, for example, when we consider a LEO to ground uh, communication, the typical size of the beam over Earth is the, of the order of hundreds of meters, which gives us a se uh, interesting security. I mean, if our receiver is outside that beam diameter, then simply one cannot really cannot access those data at all. Infrared. The it's infrared because one problem, I mean, it all sounds great as long as we have no clouds. Okay, I mean, if we have clouds, then the show is over, but we will always have some residual absorption in the atmosphere, and this 1.5 micron uh, frequency band is convenient in that respect because the transmission is, is relatively high. And another Another reason for using 1.5 microns is that we have a lot of components from regular terrestrial fiber optical communication. People use in this context acronym COTS, commercial off the shelf uh, components. So one, one, pro one issue is that we, we have to have nice weather to operate, but for example, if we have several ground stations separated by hundreds of, of kilometers, there is always, statistically, there will be a pretty good chance that, that we can establish a communication link at least with one of the ground stations. Another challenge that is not uh, present to that degree in radio frequency communication, especially in the LEO to ground scenario, is that if our satellite moves so fast, we really have to make sure that the beam the, the, the data carrying beam points in the right direction, and this direction is uh, updated actually quite quite fast. But those things, all those things can be can be actually managed. Let me start from the most extreme regime when we are uh, interested in uh, collecting data from deep space missions. This is the current state of the art radio frequency communication network. Here we can see that up to roughly one astronomical unit, we can have uh, data rates up to hundreds of megabits. And then we have a, a one over distance, uh, distance uh, squared scaling, which means basically that we are limited by the received power of our signal. The data rate is directly proportional to the received power. The most extreme scenario here is a transfer of data from Voyager missions that were launched more than 40 years ago. And here you can see that the transmit antenna is actually one of the largest components of, of, of that spacecraft. It's 3.7 meters. And as far as, if I remember correctly, 
the emitted, emitted power is, I think, 20 watts of power, and it enab enables uh, communication at data rate 160 bits per second, which is not that impressive, but one can uh, observe very interesting effects. And I, here I'm not an expert, so please correct me if I, if if my story is not is not uh, really true. What uh, happened several years ago, uh, NASA and collaborate, their collaborate, institutional collaborators were able to observe actually that Voyager missions left the heliosphere. And the way they managed to do it is the observation of the so-called termination shock. Uh, this is, is, if I understand correctly, this is the, uh, the, the ranch where solar wind particles slow down so that they achieve uh, subsonic velocities. Apparently a very good way to model it is to go to your kitchen and just to open a tap. And then it's up to until some point you see a nice radial flow of water, which corresponds to the regime when the speed is uh, of, of, of particles of water is faster than the speed of propagation of sound. And then at some point, one can see that abrupt change called termination shock. And this was seen for the solar wind particles around, uh, no, there are no years here given, but I think this was, you know, this is 20, 2018, I think around 2018, the sudden drop of solar wind particles was observed, and at the same time, both missions observed an increase in the uh, number of, inter, uh, of higher energy particles that were uh, attributed to the interstellar matter. So even this 160 bits per second is uh, very interesting, uh, is very, provides very interesting scientific data. Uh, bit, forwarding by more than 40 aha uh, now this is this is this was of course all done at radio frequencies when we if we switch to uh, optical frequencies one system that has been actually operational for i think more than 20 years is edrs uh, european data relay system and the idea is very simple you have low earth orbit satellites that collect uh, observational data and the problem is that you cannot really transfer those data to the ground station all the time simply because those LEO satellites, they fly all over the Earth. So the idea is that first what we do, we transfer data from a LEO satellite to a geostationary satellite. And the advantage is that a single geostationary satellite in principle can see our LEO satellite slightly less than half of the time. But if we put several geo satellites, they should cover everything for us. And then only we transfer data from a geostationary satellite to Earth. And those LEO to geo links have been optical for, I think, more than 10 years. Uh, the, just to give you an idea, the transmit telescope has 10 centimeter uh, diameter. And actually, our colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of light in Erlangen, they observed, they measured those signals uh, several years ago, and they verified that actually sing signals coming from uh, space, they are, they can be detected at the shot noise limit. You can easily imagine what was their interest here. Uh, moving a bit further uh, into space and getting closer uh, and continuing the deep space, uh, deep space theme. This is the Psyche mission that was launched last year. And in addition to the regular radio frequency communication link, it, uh, it also has DSOC terminal. DSOC stands from, for deep space optical communication, which has much smaller aperture because it, uh, it has only 22 centimeter aperture and sends four watts of power. To receive that signal actually takes a bit of effort. You need a 5.1 meter a telescope. The telescope is located in San Diego County in, in California, but you also need to tell your transmitter, uh, your optical terminal on board 
in which direction it should send the beam. So you actually need another you need another telescope that will send to the satellite a so-called beacon that will send a laser beam to your spacecraft. Look, look at me. And it doesn't really matter. It is sufficient that the telescope sending the laser beam is located in, this, in the same state. You, they, they don't really have to be next to each other. And another advantage is that if you modulate this uh, beacon beam, you can also have some data transmission from ground to uh, to the spacecraft. You can you can have the so-called uplink. And if you are interested how much data you can uh, you can transfer that way, what we did recently, we look uh, est we took estimates for the uh, for the Psyche mission, for communication from the Psyche mission to a European telescope that is uh, based in Greece and Pelopones Peninsula on the Helmos Island. This is the so called uh, Aristarchos uh, telescope. So the expected, what is, uh, the expected data rates are of the order of hundreds of megabits per second. And what is interesting is that we are actually dealing with very few photons. We all we are doing all that with uh, hundreds of thousands of, of photons per second at best, or even less than that. So here the big question is how this is the, this is usually referred to as photon starved communication, and the big question is how do you uh, use the available photon flux efficiently? Uh, so what we did, we compared the expected data rates with what can be achieved by uh, optimizing slightly the modulation format. But then we pointed out is that actually what limits us usually is the background noise that is picked up by our optical signal on the way. And if we use more advanced filtering techniques, then actually we could beat the data rates, we could uh, increase the data rates by a factor of, of several. And in principle, we might be able to achieve even data, daytime operation when the background noise is much higher. But we, we, this is something that has to be studied, studied further. Uh, moving back closer to Earth, if we are interested in optical communication, the space industry has been undergoing a huge transformation uh, stemming from the fact that building and launching satellites have become much, much cheaper. The current standard are so-called nanosatellites or CubeSats that are based on a, a, a single module that is roughly 10 by 10 by 11 centimeters and we can stack them. For example, this is a single unit, 3U uh, satellite would mean that we have three such cubes stuck together. And if you, the price of launching such a CubeSat into space has become quite reasonable. And this actually transformed dramatically the space industry, at least when it comes to low Earth orbit missions, because instead of building something very carefully, testing it a million times, verifying that everything works perfectly and as it should and so on and so on, we can just build something, send it into space. If it doesn't work, we can think, scratch our heads, think what might have gone wrong, try to build something a little bit better and launch it again. And the cost of this, uh, let's keep trying uh, approach has become relatively reasonable. And now uh, the second, now the, an interesting aspect is how to equip our cubed, our uh, nano satellites with optical communication terminals. So here is actually a graph from a few years ago that shows that if we put a device on a CubeSat like a magnetometer, three megapixel camera, hyperspectral imaging device, or a camera collecting a low resolution video, and if we compare communication at different radio frequency bands with optical communication, which is the last red bar, then actually the power budget for the onboard becomes quite fa favorable for for optical communication, like 6U uh, CubeSat 
is able uh, with 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 solar panels is able to provide enough electrical power to uh, for transmission of low uh, resolution videos whereas this would not have been possible with uh, radio frequency communication and things have got much better since 20, 2016. Uh, the same this generates a lot of interesting theoretical problems actually how efficiently we can use available bandwidth and available power but i will not get here the question uh, i would like to ask is that if we have those nano satellite terminals which you you can buy or you can or I think it's fair to say that you can order them now they will be delivered in in, in time uh, in a matter of, of of single years now the big question that I would like to address here is what about physical layer security which means what happens if someone has access to our uh, uh, to, to, to our uh, communication channel and if you think about uh, modern optical communication, the physical layer of uh, those systems is completely naked. And everybody knows that, everybody accepts that, and everybody knows how to deal with that. Okay? So the, the basic assumption is that everybody can eavesdrop our signal. And we are trying to use encryption or te uh, authentication techniques in the software layer, in the digital layer, to make sure that if our data is sensitive, then a third party cannot access it, or that we can verify that we are talking to the entity we are supposed to talk to, to nobody else. So when it comes to physical layer security in space, one, uh, one uh, point of view would be that uh, space optical communication is intrinsically secure or at least is more secure than radio frequency communication because of the finite diameter of our uh, of our laser uh, beam on earth which we mentioned at the very beginning but this may not be sufficient imagine for example that the size of the laser beam on earth is of the order of hundreds of meters but we are, let's call it, uh, in a hostile environment, and we, our receiver, our ground station, is located in an area that of which we control only, let's say, diameter of tens or uh, of, of tens of meters. So, what can we do about it? Well, every, I'm sure that everybody in this room knows the answer to that: is to use quantum key distribution. And quantum key distribution has been with us for, I think. Well, 40 years, because BB84, as the name suggests, has been described 40 years ago. So we know that we can use different variables of the optical field to implement quantum key distribution. We can uh, explore different levels of security, or we can use different degrees of freedom. And there have been very uh, nice and very impressive demonstrations of uh, QKD technology. But if we stick to the optical fibers, we know that the, the killer of optical key distribution is attenuation in optical fibers that is exponential. There is a way to mitigate it proposed recently called uh, twin field QKD, which allows us to reduce the scaling with distance by a factor of two, but it doesn't really uh, explore the uh, solve the problem in a systematic way so this is why people uh, are interested in satellite qkd links because in the case of free space links we are limited by the fraction losses which scale like one over distance squared in principle we might be able to generate a qkd uh, key between more distant points on Earth, and the most impressive demonstration done so far is the Misius satellite, which implements a version of Eckert protocol. Uh, but if we, I mean, this was a, a really big satellite, uh, 
if we do the numbers and if we look how much key was generated, the eventually the key rate was well below one bit per second. Under uh, this was in a scenario when the satellite was distributing entangled photon pairs to two ground stations. So in this, what is nice in this scenario is that we don't have to trust satellite. We don't, we verify on the ground that our photon pairs were indeed entangled. If we relax this condition and say that the satellite can be used as a so-called trusted node, which means that it, we generate a cryptographic key between a satellite and one ground station, then between a satellite and a second ground station, then we can reach uh, over a single pass for a LEO satellite uh, of the order of hundreds of thousands of bits for a single pass in, a, in the case of Misius satellite. And this figure is reduced by a factor of 10 for CubeSat satellites. Misius was actually much better, much, much, much bigger than, than a typical CubeSat satellite. But the point I would like to make here, and I hope I still have some time for that, is that in some sense, QKD is uh, an overkill for free space optical communication. I mean, QKD in principle prevents us, well, QKD assumes that an adversary can collect all the signal that doesn't make it to the legitimate receiver, and that, that can manipulate the signal on the way from the sender to the receiver in any way that is allowed by a uh, quantum computer in print or in other words uh, that is allowed by by laws of physics or in other words we assume that the adversary can place a quantum computer between the sender of and the receiver which maybe is not exactly the type of an attack we should be worried in the coming years so the question is if we can do something in a we can provide physical layer security in a way that is first simpler and second cheaper. If you think about those QKD solutions, there are uh, for device uh, for for discrete variable QKD usually we need single photons, and detection of single photons still is quite a, a challenge. If we look at continuous variable quantum key distribution. Well, we either have to have a very, very good receiver or we, again, we have to make some auxiliary solutions. People seem more and more happy by uh, using, by resorting to those auxiliary solutions. But okay, if we think about security as a continuous parameter, then we should really look more uh, broadly to find to find the, the sweet spot. And I will try to uh, to, to convince you, to, I, what I would like to do, I would like to prevent, to suggest that, uh, and that, that there is an interesting alternative. We call this alternative optical key distribution to avoid confusion with quantum key distribution, because as you see, it uses different property of light, a, a weaker property than, than QKD. So we use for that the acronym OKD, but what I like about this acronym is that if we add a little dash to O, this will be Q if we, if we make this change. And this was originally proposed uh, by two Japanese researchers in 2016. And the idea is very, very nice. Again, we have Alice and Bob. Alice emits pulses that make it to Bob after some attenuation. And we assume that one of the, some of the signal, some of all the signal that got lost actually makes it to if. So we will have two parameters, one transmission from Alice to Bob, and the second parameter transmission from Alice to Eve. In the worst case scenario, transmission to Eve is one minus transmission to Bob, but in principle, we can also assume that some of the signal is lost and doesn't make it to either Bob or Eve. And the idea is very simple. Alice use, uses intensity modulation, which usually is referred in, in telecommunications with the acronym IM for intensity modulation. But in contrast to typical intensity modulation to send data, she changes the 
optical energy of her pulse is very little. So the, let's assume that the average number of photons is either N0, if she wants to generate a key bit zero, or N1, if she wants to generate a key bit one. I will tell you in a moment what should be the difference between these two optical energies, okay? So let's assume that the average optical, that both uh, bits are equiprobable, bit values are equiprobable. So N bar will be our average optical energy per pulse. We will be especially interested in a regime when if receives a stronger signal, if, we, if when Reef receives a larger fraction of the signal than Bob. And for now, let's assume a macroscopic model. So, of course, everybody in this room knows that in principle, if we have a, a quantum limited photodetector, uh, then we will have Poissonian statistics on Bob's and Eve's detectors. And by the way, what we do is just we just count photons, which is called in uh, telecommunications direct detection. So what we are doing here, in other words, is direct detection. So at the most fundamental level, of course, the statistics of photo counts is given by Poissonian distribution with the average uh, depending on the incoming uh, pulse optical energy, but let's assume that we operate in the macroscopic regime and let's assume, let's approximate our uh, distributions for photo counts by Gaussians and let's uh, treat the photo count number as a continuous variable. The advantage of that is that we can also include thermal noise of our detectors by uh, assuming that the variance of our Ga Gaussian distribution is larger than this uh, implied by the shot noise, okay? So if we assume that both Bob and Eve are as good, have detectors that are as good as it gets, they take the shot noise limit for the variances of our distribution, but in principle, those variances can be, can be bigger. And now, what, what about this modulation depth on Alice's side? So the modulation depth, the, the basic principle is that the modulation depth should be such that for Eve, it is pretty difficult to discriminate whether Alice has sent a stronger pulse or a weaker pulse. Under the assumption that Bob receives a smaller fraction of signal and that his detector is not much better than Eve's detector, which we want to avoid that assumption, this task for Bob to discriminate between these two pulse energies or equivalently these two bit values is even more difficult. And now what we would, but what we would like to do, we would like to post select events such that Bob's knowledge about those events will actually be uh, higher, will actually be better than Eve's knowledge. And the idea is uh, very simple. Bob should look only at the outermost events, okay? So Bob rejects everything that is in the middle. If, we, if he receives an event that is very, very to the left of both his distributions, then it's very reasonable for him that actually as Alice sent a weaker pulse, which means that Alice tried to send a key bit value zero. And on the other hand, if Bob receives a very large value, then he can be pretty confident that Alice uh, sent value one. The problem for if is that actually photo count numbers or results of, of intensity measurements on Bob's and Eve's detectors are statistically uncorrelated. So even if if, if Bob detected an event from one of those two outermost regions, it is very likely that if, that if obtained a result somewhere from the very middle, and for those post-selected events, actually if gets much more, much less information. So many of you may recognize that this is actually the idea of reverse reconciliation for continuous variable QKD. What we are doing here, we are actually talking about a poor man's version of CVQKD, uh, uh, operating on light intensity rather than quadratures. Because we operate on light intensity, the typical 
as uh, the typical uh, intercept and recent strategy would actually uh, would be result in lack of security between Alice and Bob because it is sufficient for uh, it would be sufficient for if simply to capture those pulses measure the uh, number of photons or measure the intensity and then something to send uh, accordingly uh, light pulse to Bob but we exclude this type of attacks from our analysis so uh, this uh, strategy of dual threshold discrimination that I just described is actually gives the simplest intuition why this way of generating a secure cryptographic key will work. It is not necessarily the optimal one because in principle uh, Alice and Bob can try to distill a key from the continuous distributions of measurement outcomes on Bob's side. On Bob's side. We will call this strategy soft decoding which is doable but requires more computational power so that uh, those who are trying to implement it may not necessarily be happy about soft decoding but for calculating the key rates it is a nice scenario in practice the the simplest way to get eventually a cryptographic key would be this dual threshold discrimination that we will refer to as hard decoding so what we did a while ago, we actually performed a theoretical analysis, how much key can be generated in this scenario. Uh, using we, Everything can be expressed using a single parameter that characterizes how good uh, Bob is at detecting the signal compared to if. So actually the lower R, the more, uh, the more advantage if has. And the result is very simple. The result is that the amount of the key for large if's advantage scales proportionally uh, with this parameter. Uh, a basic reference is actually the assumption that instead of binary modulation of Alice signal that I described, Alice implements Gaussian modulation, then actually the calculation is, is very nice and, and analytical. If we now switch from uh, Gaussian modulation to binary modulation, we lose something uh, by doing soft decoding. And then if we do this hard decoding based on your threshold discrimination, we lose even a little bit more key. And one can, the, one can derive nice analytical formulas for that. Uh, given... Uh, this actually, this, uh, sorry, excuse me, this uh, calculation actually gives us recipe how, what should be the modulation depth on Alice's side. And the answer to that is that Alice should know how much of her signal will make it to Eve. And basically, the uh, Alice should ensure that this two distributions that are generated on each side, that they are separated by a distance that is comparable with the, uh, with the uh, standard deviations, with the widths of those distributions. Also for uh, hard decoding, one can ask where, what is the optimal strategy for Bob to place the discrimination thresholds. And what is actually quite interesting is that those thresholds are relatively high, uh, which means uh, are, are relatively next to each other, which means that Bob should uh, have error correcting codes that deal with relatively high probabilities of error. And these are not regimes that are typically encountered in, in conventional data transmission or even in QKD, because in QKD, when people see error rates, error probabilities of the order of 10%, they simply abort the protocol because the eavesdropper has learned too much about it. But what is nice is that those two parameters are, are actually relatively independent on the assumed uh, eavesdropper's advantage. If we are in this uh, very, very advantageous if regime, which means that one can uh, one can work on on the protocol, assuming that some of those parameters are are pretty much constant. Uh, we also looked uh, into some 
unconventional attacks, for example, what happens if the weaker pulse has a slightly different shape than the stronger pulse in the OKD protocol, and then things get actually a bit sticky, because if Eve is able to separate, to perform a decomposition in temporal modes that tells her whether this was exactly the one of the modes or whether there was an addition from another mode corresponding to the other qubit value, then actually it is sufficient for Eve to detect just one photon in this additional mode to figure out what is, uh, what is happening. So we really have to be careful, assuming that Eve can implement this, this type of an attack. Actually, this, this paper got, got accepted in IEEE communication letters. We were quite concerned by this type of attack, but one of the three referees said, come on, what are you talking about? QPG, QPG is so advanced that nobody will bother uh, with that kind of attack in practice, which tells you quite a bit about the attitude of, of engineers towards uh, physical layer security. So, this, uh, so finally, if I could use a few last minutes, I would like to tell you a little bit about the experimental demonstration that we realized together with our colleagues from the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun and Warsaw University of Technology in the electronics building actually at Platz Polytechniki. They have a very nice Faraday chamber there, uh, which, which came useful. So what we did here, we combine the optical key distribution with regular data transmission by using a hierarchical type of encoding. So the idea is that we use actually four uh, intensities that are grouped into two pairs. So the, uh, the classical bit or data bit is encoded as zero in one of these two states, inputs, the, uh, tr transmitted uh, pulses, and uh, data one or classical bit value one is encoded in one of these two, whereas we use fine modulation on top of that to generate the cryptographic key. What is nice is that we can do both data transmission and secure key generation in the same wavelength channel and using basically the same optical power. We just need to control our modulation uh, more, more precisely than it's, it's done in usual systems. Uh, so now we need to have several discrimination thresholds, one threshold that will tell us the classical bit value, other thresholds that uh, tell us what is the row key bit value for a, a given shot. Then we have to implement uh, error correction. We need to implement privacy uh, amplification based on assumption how much if has learned. We also tried to understand whether we are shot noise limited. We were not in that experiment. Uh, Okay, so before we did an experiment, we did simulations for a LEO to ground link. And what we realized is that the amount of the key that can be generated using this technique on top of regular data transmission is actually pretty attractive compared to, uh, to regular QKD. Here you can see the key bit rates of the order of gigabits or megabits per second, assuming that uh, if telescope is 10 times larger than Bob's telescope. So if you compare this key uh, lengths over a single pass for a LEO satellite compared to the B84, this is, the difference is quite dramatic. And now uh, what we did, we built a test bed. Well, this was actually built mainly by my colleagues Michał Yahura from Warsaw and Kuba Szlachetka from, from Toruń. Here you can see a very nice experiment. You have a transmitter, you have a channel, and you have a receiver. So the, this was what it looked like in practice, and this was in this Faraday chamber because of some very strong radio stations near, uh, near Platz Polytechniki. So what we had to learn on the way actually is how to generate a signal that has limited bandwidth so that we avoid distortion and this was a very good opportunity to, to learn uh, 
about the so-called root-raised cosine waveform, which I was never taught at the Faculty of Physics at the university. And after we did all, well, Michał and Kuba, after they all did everything, they were able to discriminate the classical bit values and within that Gaussian corresponding to classical one and classical zero by proper post-processing, they were able to actually uh, extract a secure key, uh, which means the, the, the system operated effectively at the symbol rate 50, uh, 500 megabytes per second. And for that uh, symbol rate, we effectively are able to generate to generate a cryptographic key at the rates of tens of megabytes, assuming that Eve has the same access to the signal as Bob. This rate will, of course, will uh, go down if we, if Eve has uh, more signal and has access to more signal. We also, because this is a collaboration with Toruń, we also try to transmit an image of Nikolaus Copernicus uh, here. So with that, let me conclude. So the big picture is that optical communication is about the corner. Everybody believes that optical communication will, will really take off into space in the coming years. When, we, when you look at the number of startups, if you look at the interest from the, from the industry, it's quite substantial. And what I tried to convince you using a very specific example is that if we decide to worry about physical layer security in uh, space communication systems, then we should look at a whole spectrum of solutions. Quantum key distribution is at one end because it offers really robust protection, but at, the, at a pretty high cost, financial cost, and the complexity of the systems. But there are also other solutions that one might uh, look into which are most call it most cost effi cost efficient much easier to implement and they may actually uh, take into account immediate or uh, near term attacks for on on the communication systems thank you very much thank you very much for a very interesting talk and now we have time for questions it was a very nice demonstration of plus point techniki, but is there any chance to have a collaboration and test this using satellites right now? Uh, we are working on that. This, this is our dream actually, to have a satellite with uh, a demonstration satellite with that solution. I have two questions if I may. Is there any chance that quantum mechanics quantum theory enters also this uh, purely optical uh, way of distributing a key. Uh, so in some sense, it enters in a, you know, some people talk about QKD that this is quantum to zero, where quantum one zero were lasers. So I would argue that this is quantum 1.5 for quantum three halves, because uh, here we have fundamental limitations related to the shot noise. I mean, if we assume that if is limited by the shot noise, then we can have some, uh, this gives us some amount of the key that is secure with respect to passive eavesdropping and if cannot do anything about it because her, her detectors will be limited by the shot noise. So we have quantum limit on the security under an assumption that if is restricted only to passive eavesdropping. So in this sense, I would call it uh, quantum 1.5. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's, it's of course hypothetical, but assuming that you have a dedicated enemy who is uh, interested really to take it over, that's as simple as that. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that because of the of the t t telescope that would be needed on that drone. I mean, this oh, is you have a, you have two drones. One is uh, taking uh, from uh, Alice, and another is sending to Bob with correction for being placed, say, kilometer away in a very comfortable big plane, which is 
just uh, have sufficient electricity and equipment to transmit whatever you like. But you have no way to know. That, that's the whole difference with quantum cryptography. You don't have any fundamental uh, physical assumptions which prevent cloning. Of course, I mean, this, this signal can be cloned. And if an adversary can lift an optical ground station uh, not necessarily into space, but uh, well, high enough above the ground, then I agree. And this is what I'm saying from the very beginning, that this is not an attack. We are, uh, we are, uh, we want to protect ourselves against. Another attack is denial of service attack. And if you have 1.5 micron, you, we hear every morning about the impurities 2.5 microns, which are close enough to produce uh, significant scattering of 1.5 micron photons. So if you just make a fire nearby and have any chemical resources to produce a cloud of smoke, which will deny, deny service. Yeah, I mean, denial of, I mean, this is, this is a problem for any kind of, of free space yeah. optical, optical communication. The point, I, I, maybe I, I haven't made that point clearly enough, I mean, when it comes to physical layer security, I wouldn't rely on the security of either a QKD key or OKD key or any key that is generated in the physical layer. Because one can, even for QKD, I mean, the idea sounds very nice in principle, but when people start looking at implementation security, I would say that this is a big mess. So, I mean, the way I would view key gen any kind of a key generated in the physical layer of a communication system is just as an additional element of security that should be used in the whole stack encryption stack in a way that doesn't compromise that stack okay and from that perspective of course i mean you can have uh, you can have a man or woman in the middle attack for 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 uh, OKD, but I don't. Th this is uh, this is what we should really spell out clearly our security assumptions. And I would argue that the system with that kind of attack should also offer. I mean, one has to estimate the likelihood of that kind of attack, which I don't think will be always high or will be high in any. And in most scenarios we, we are looking into, and we should make sure that the security of present systems is preserved also with this uh, additional key generated in the physical layer. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Uh, okay, I have a question. What exactly, to what extent does this crypto cryptographic analysis depend on the quality of signal Eve is able to to gather, and do you need to make some assumptions about that when you when you when you actually try to implement this uh, whole scheme? Yes. So the the harder, the, I mean, the toughest assumption would be that Eve collects the entire signal that doesn't mm -hmm. make it to Bob. Uh, then the key rates would be comparable with those of QKD under weaker security assumptions. I mean, in practice, I mean, if if let's say our telescope is 30 centimeters. I mean, you, you have seen that for deep space receivers, the telescope diameter is, is five meters. And this is not something that one could conceal easily in, in urban environments. So I wouldn't, uh, th this is kind of, a, you know, we have this parameter that we can uh, slide. I don't think that uh, I would say that 10 dB advantage or 20 dB advantage to this is, is, would be very reasonable in most scenarios. One big problem when it comes to atmosphere, which I didn't mention, but we also did some studies, is uh, fluctuating transmission through atmosphere. This is actually a big field. Uh, modeling uh, changes in the atmospheric transmission uh, well, you can have both static models when you have simply a probability distribution for your transmission and you assume that this transmission is constant for a time period of the order of milliseconds 
or another option is that you, you, you try to continuously check the transmission according to, to some models. This is a big problem also for regular data transmission, because you, I, you really need to have very large uh, budget margins to account for a possibility that at some point the transmission drops. And here we really have to be careful to consider how much of the signal makes it to Bob under this variable transmission and we have to assume something uh, about how much signal is, uh, is is making to Eve in this case mm -hmm. so we are doing that right now actually thank you mm, are there any questions any more questions hi uh, thanks for the talk um so i have a question about your the second point in your summary uh you say that physical air security is an outstanding issue um so could you talk about like what adding physical air security like your OCD protocol buys you compared to just having normal classical cryptography on your data? Like what scenarios does it help you in? I don't uh, could you repeat? Like when, when does adding this to the normal classical cryptography we do help you? Like what adversaries does it help against or what scenarios does it help Well, you? it makes adversaries' life more difficult. That's, that's my point. I mean, you know, if you look, if when uh, when uh, security when uh, encryption protocols uh, use some pre-shared secret mm -hmm. okay uh, so you can ask what happens if this pre-shared secret leaks at some point earlier or maybe even later here you can this you can uh, <laughs> renew this secret continuously or you can renew this secret from time to time imagine for example that you have okay uh, you have some uh, 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 you have a server and to access that server remotely you've got a password mm -hmm. so it really makes a difference if you refresh that password every month or every day or every minute or every second i mean if you can refresh your password every second then someone who got hold of your password from yesterday uh, we will will this will be use, useless to him or her. So that would be that would be my argument. We would like to have this continuous source of shared secrets, which might uh, which would uh, make regular algorithmic encryption more difficult to break. Simply because the history will will not help us that much anymore. Okay, thanks. So in this case, uh, please uh, let us thank the speaker again. Thank you.